Dobrodan. It's uh, good to be back in Slovenia again. I've been here a number of times. I've often said it's one of my favorite European countries. Excellent food, uh, beautiful countryside, and likable, crazy people. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Bojadar uh, for organizing this meeting. I see him as a true crusader to the cause and a definite pioneer and a wonderful guy. And thank his crew as well <laughs> for putting this together. I should also thank my Canadian sponsors down... Oh. I'm going to finish my thank yous. Uh, my Canadian sponsor here, Canutra Naturals, they're a whole plant medicine people too. They treat the plant. They're looking for the nutritional as well as the medical value of the plant. And uh, I'm of the same persuasion. I'm a whole plant medicine guy. I don't believe in synthetics or highly purified cannabinoids. And I'll be talking mostly about that today, the difference between synthetics and natural product uh, cannabis. And I, this is the group that I'm working with in Slovenia, Natural Remedies Research and Quality Assurance Institute. Uh, it's a new organization, and I'm taking part mostly in the laboratory work because I'm, a, I'm an analyst or analyst, depends how you look at it in English. Um, and I, I'm a lab guy, I, I like winking lights, and I don't like people that much, and I like staying up alone in the lab. Um, it was an excellent lab I can work with here in Ljubljana. So we're, we're attempting to tighten up qu uh, quality control and, and analysis of a medical cannabis to take the variation out of our analytical result. And it's a little difficult when you consider bud samples that are all very different and even extracts that uh, tend to vary quite a bit. We're looking to get between three or four different labs, split results, in, and hone in on really accurate uh, uh, data that we produce. Uh, this all started way back when, when I was doing my doctorate degree in, in India. We worked with uh, people with very high rate of oral cancer. And oh, they were chewing what's called betel quid, which is a, a mixture of tobacco, a stimulant nut called the betel nut, part of the leaf of the plant, and calcium hydroxide made from burning seashells. And they'd mix this all together and chew it for hours. And they ha had a very high incidence of oral cancer. We were there to try to identify the carcinogens, plus we put them on an intervention study using beta carotene and vitamin A, and at the same time mapped the precancerous lesions inside of their mouths with a, a specialized camera. Then we put them on vitamin A and beta carotene for six months and looked at the change in result. And indeed, we saw a 57% reduction in the oral lesions and the reason I'm scraping this fellow's mouth is to take out buccal mucosal cells. We put them on a slide, take them back to Vancouver, and analyze for DNA damage. This is early cancer research, and uh, we, showed, uh, we showed that you could actually protect epithelial cancers using vitamin supplementation. And I was involved in a clinical study there, but I guess the point of this slide is to I was, had the opportunity of using high-tech uh, analytical equipment very early in my career. I've been running high-pressure liquid chromatography since seven years after the, the tech, that, that technique became available, so I'm, a, I'm an old HPLC jockey. And uh, about that time, I... I started, I saw a lot of old people in India that weren't taking heart meds or um, antidepressants. They were using what they call Ayurvedic medicine, which is a herbal type of medicine. 
And I started comparing notes between pharmaceutical type medicine, sy synthetic medicine, and natural product medicine. And a friend of mine once said, the drugs should be tested on the people that make them. If you make a vaccine, you try it and try it on your kids and uh, make sure that it works. And I, I don't believe that medicine should kill you. I think it should make you well. I'm going to talk today about drugs that kill you. Bob, Bob had a, a much better rendition of this slide. I only put this up. Like Bob said, there's many enzymes in here. This is the metabolic pathway inside of one bacterial cell. And we are billions of cells. And I put this up. I'm going to lead you through this today. I'm <laughs> just kidding. But I put this up to show that we are not simple. We are the most complex, highly organized biological systems on this planet. And we are just not simple. But the way we make sense of, of medicine in humans is we do clinical trials, we do analytical, we have really good, well, we've got probably the best diagnostics uh, ever known, and we can figure out what's happening in, in illness, but we, we don't have very good ways of treating it. Um, this is my opinion. Um, but in, in the lab, any good full cannabinoid lab, you have high pressure liquid chromatography and gas chromatography mass spectroscopy. This is abbreviated HPLC. For high pressure liquid chromatography, you could also call it high price li liquid chromatography because these instruments cost around 100,000 euro each, and they're not cheap. But, but with these two instruments, we can see virtually any molecule known to man. We can identify it and quantify it. And I've been doing that in the cannabis plant for almost 20 years. I'm not going to show you much of this chromatography. I used to do this in lectures, and I, I'm sorry if I, I bored you to tears because nobody would really know what I'm talking about. But these are, this is an HPLC chromatogram of three different cannabis strains overlaid. I want to make a point about this, that the blue trace is BC bud, or where I come from, high THC, what they call recreational cannabis. I don't know what recreational means. Um, anyway, it's high THC. The bigger the peak, the more of the compound. High THC, low cannabidiol. Then if you look at hemp strains, high CBD, very little THC, less than 1%. And if you cross the two strains, one in four will come out what I call a 50-50, roughly equal THC and CBD. In my data banks, I have more than 15,000 profiles of this type. If you overlay them all, you only see those three ratios of THC to CBD. Either high THC, low CBD, less than 1%, high CBD, low THC, less than 1%, and a roughly equal CBD and THC. And I say it, it is written, or I call it the three-way split. Dr. Hanush, who you uh, heard earlier, told me there's four. There's a fourth one with low THC and low CBD. Uh, it may be relevant for a placebo, but um, not as relevant as this amount of THC or this amount of cannabidiol. I call, <laughs> I used to call this type of cannabis psycho weed because it gets you very high, um, but it's also very useful for cancer and uh, many other illnesses. I'm a great believ believer in cannabidiol for its medical value, and this is the, the strain that you grow in Slovenia mostly, is high cannabidiol type hemp, extremely valuable. Now this is work, this is a, a GCMS profile, this will be the last profile I show you, but this is a work of art. I, I love this, this chromatogram because it, it shows the, the terpenoids and then the cannabinoids. And you notice again, it's 
high amount of THC and lower amounts of cannabidiol and, and, and cannabinol. This is an extract and it's decarboxylated. So you see the relative abundance of THC to the other cannabinoids. These are 140 odd other cannabinoids being detected. In the lab, we can bl blow this part of the chromatogram up and see the other cannabinoids, but notice the difference in concentration. The other cannabinoids are there in trace amounts. You have to go after a specific cannabinoid like CBG or CBC uh, to extract it and increase that concentration. And this is probably uh, myrcene and perhaps limonene, which are the most abundant terpenoids in, in most cannabis. These are what we call trichomes. Um, pot smokers call it sugar or crystal. The cannabinoids and terpenoids are made in these, these balls here. These are stock and the, they're actually manufactured in the base of this waxy covered lab. You can actually tell the difference between an indigo and a sativa by the size of these, these balls here. I say indigos have big balls and sativas have little ones. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, this is where most of the, the medicine, maybe 90 or 80 percent of the medicine is contained in the plant. As Dr. Hanush pointed out, there are flavonoids and polyphenols, but most of those are in the, the flower and the, the stem of the plant. This, having a lot of the medical value as an exudate on the outside of the plant, it makes it easy to get at by, by extraction, solvent extraction or CO2, because you're not having to dive into the plant material to pull out the valuable medicine. You can just shake it off. We use a, a sieving procedure or a tumbling procedure to isolate the trichomes from the plant material. And also you leave behind chlorophyll, which is very important because chlorophyll can often give extracts of bad taste or a bad smell, and most processors want to leave chlorophyll in the plant. I use this term efficacy a lot. It means the desired effect. Uh, if you take a cough medicine and it kills you, that's indeed an effect. If you take the cough medicine and it clears up and, and you feel better, that's an efficacious cough medicine. So when we talk about efficacy, we mean it, the desired effect. And this doesn't take into account side effects. It's just the desired effect in a given situation. This is a, a spectrum of cannabis efficacy. It's huge. It's unprecedented with any other medicine that it could be effective in so many different illnesses, from ADHD to Tourette's syndrome. Um, there's a reason for this, and I'll get into that a bit later, but this is really as good as you can get in terms of valuable medicine. Now I want to talk about natural versus synthetic uh, compounds. Often you'll go to a grocery store and buy vitamin C. It's, it's called ascorbic acid. That's one molecule. Natural vitamin C is a mixture of eight different molecules. There's tyrosinase and an enzyme in there, rutin, bioflavonoids. And vitamin, natural vitamin C, if you can find it other than in an orange, is 10 times more potent than uh, synthetic vitamin C. Also with sea salt, which we, you can commonly purchase, uh, sea salt contains uh, magnesium, potassium, sodium, oh. Uh, potassium, magnesium, calcium salts that are not present in table salt, which is just pure sodium chloride. Runners will use sea salt uh, because if they use sodium chloride, they'll cramp and, and get tired very quickly, but with sea salt, they, they don't experience this. Natural cannabis versus synthetic, this is Marinol. 
and uh, it's a synthetic uh, form of THC. Marinols, you can get it by prescription, yet uh, the plant is often Schedule One in many countries that you can't get it. Marinol is subject to side effects, and you get less side effects with natural cannabis. In terms of efficacy and usefulness of cannabis, I had my lab in what we call a dispensary or a, an association, as they call it in Spain, or a buyer's club, as they have in Slovenia, for five years. And I wit witnessed roughly 4,000 people coming in to purchase cannabis and use it therapeutically. 80% were treating pain symptoms, chronic pain. And that's 24-7 pain that doesn't go away from a car accident, uh, on-the-job injury or falls, even viral and uh, uh, bacterial infection can cause chronic pain. This is our um, common method for treating pain is opiates. You might be able to get morphine in a natural form, but all these rest are synthetics. These are most overdosed opiates here. Fentanyl is deadly. Um, and this is a graph showing uh, opiate deaths, more common than heroin by prescribed opiates. And they're all on the increase in prescription and resulting deaths. Where I come from in Vancouver, we have a, an epidemic of uh, deaths due to fentanyl. Not to undermine the tragedy that happened in Manchester, but we have the same sort of thing happening in Vancouver every four days as a result of fentanyl. Uh, people are dropping like flies. So, let's say here, four days in Vancouver equals one, one Manchester. The average terrorist att attack kills 20 people. We do that every couple of days. And the European Union is not spared from this. It's increased 79 percent be between 2013 and 2014. Not a clear slide again, but this is pointing at Portugal that has one of the lowest uh, death rates due to drug overdose because they decriminalized a couple of years ago and they found that removing the taboo from drug use, people don't desire it so much, particularly the young people. They're not seeking out cannabis or um, heroin or cocaine uh, b before they did when it was illegal. So this is a really interesting experiment being done here in Europe where decriminalization or making d drugs more acceptable and, and educating the people uh, you save lives. I just want to compare cannabidiol to fentanyl. Um, fentanyl is a potent 50 times stronger than heroin synthetic opiate pain medication with rapid onset and short duration. It's an agonist, that means it binds the mu opiate receptor in the brain. Fentanyl analogs, such as car fentanyl, fentanyl are 10,000 times more potent than, than morphine. This is deadly. Um, and CBD has no psychoactive properties and there are no documented deaths. I broke my leg in Spain a year ago and also I, like Dr. Bob, I have brain damage. I slipped on ice in Vancouver six months ago. All I've used for pain and my brain injuries is high cannabidiol containing natural product cannabis. Um, I can dance. I don't, I don't always make sense, but I can, I can sing too. <laughs> and fentanyl would be two to four milligrams can be a fatal dose, and safe therapeutic doses of cannabidiol, cannabidiol be over a gram. And I <laughs> read a an experiment done with a dog where they injected the dog with six grams of THC. 
expecting it to kill it, but it didn't die. The dog was out of it for a couple of days, but uh, nevertheless, they, they couldn't kill it. There's no known LD50 for THC or for cannabidiol. I look at them as antitoxins. Um, they'll, they'll keep you alive. And fentanyl is the worst drug epidemic in American history. 100 people die a day in the US. And THC and CBD are the most popular. And once again, no, no documented deaths, but fentanyl is scheduled two, meaning it's, you can prescribe it. And CBD is scheduled one by the federal law in, in the United States. I'm going to talk about synthetic cannabinoids and uh, how they differ from natural product. There's a product called Spice, popular in the UK, as I hear. And I like the simple definition from Winnicott's Wikipedia. Synthetic cannabinoids are classic chemicals. They're different from the cannabinoids found in cannabis, but which also bind cannabinoid receptors. They're, once again, single molecule or a group of synthetic cannabinoids in a mixture of this, what they call spices, sold in retail shops, like head shops or places you buy paraphernalia and smoked, and it can be very addictive and can cause uh, problems. These are side effects. Um, Paranoia, increased anxiety, and hallucinations typically much more severe than smoking cannabis. Uh, you can easily overdose on THC, which can scare the living bejesus out of you. You'll know you're going to die, but you won't. Um, it can be a very frightening experience, an overdose on THC. Even with natural product cannabis, you take too much and uh, you get the fear. Uh, but know that you won't die. But th this, uh, this is caused from uh, synthetic uh, cannabinoids. This. These are what Alexander Shulgin used to call dirty pictures, these chemical structures. Um, Dr. Hanush likes them. I really like dirty pictures, too, because they, they tell you a lot about how the molecule will behave. This is highly fat-soluble. This is a little bit of water liking, but not much. This is mostly fat soluble. These are all very highly fat, fat soluble molecules. Now this graph here shows the difference between the receptor binding activity of THC versus these other synthetic cannabinoids. And this is also synth probably synthetic THC they're using here, but it, it has a different binding capacity then the synthetic cannabinoids would tend to lock onto the receptor and don't let go, whereas THC only partially binds the receptor and stimulates it not near as much as, as these synthetics. And in natural cannabis extracts, you have a mixture of cannabidiol, cannabinol, and a whole host of other cannabinoids, and also terpenoids that affect the response at the receptor. <laughs> These are before Dr. Hannes got a haircut. <laughs> it's probably taken in the 70s, but I, Dr. Hannes says, I've been on a number of lecture tours with him in Europe, and secretly we call him the rock star, because like myself, he's a lab rat. He likes, he's an analyst too. We like laboratories and are, he's much better that, with people than I am, but he's a, he's a sweetheart of a guy. But he, he loves being on tour, so he, he comes out and talks to people, and everybody's patting him on the back. He's like a rock star. And so he should be, because, oh, he's standing next to Dof, Dr. Raphael Mershulam, who's often credited with discovering THC and the receptor. But Lumir tells a different story, and he told it, gave a bit of the background today of the discovery of, of uh, the actives of cannabis. In my experience as a scientist, not one guy discovers it, it's a team. And uh, Lumiere was part of a, a team that discovered what the first um, 
endocannabinoid or the, the, the THC that your body builds itself to bind that receptor. He told me a very funny story that at that time, all they were working with is mice in the lab to do cannabis work, that they were after the compound produced in animals that bound that receptor. So we tried extracting it from a mice, my, mice brains, which were tiny. So he went to the market and bought a pig brain and extracted it from that. And he said, I held up the test tube and there was nothing in it. But when we washed it in the solution and added it to the receptor, we found binding. Because it's there in very small amounts. Um, but anyway, he's credited with being instrumental in discovering the first uh, endocannabinoid. And I had the privilege of going to Tel Aviv last year and meeting Dr. Mishulam. And I, I stayed at his niece's apartment. And she told me that in 1964, when he discovered THC, the family thought he was crazy. Because why are you going after this active in hashish, they said. And now he's nominated for a Nobel Prize. So. You get the point. Uh, it was Dr. Mershulam that suggested that THC activity may be influenced by other compounds present in herbal cannabis. This is what we're calling the synergistic or the entourage effect of, of cannabis. I'm not so fond of the word entourage because it suggests one principal and a crowd around them, like the cook, the chauffeur, and the, the secretary. We could look at that as all being the primary active being THC, but cannabidiol is a primary active too, and all of the other cannabinoids and terpenoids are all working together. I, I prefer synergy. Um, nevertheless, I won't try to change the terminology. And Carlini in 1974 determined that cannabis produces effect two to four times greater than that expected from THC content. So there's other compounds in the mix that are affecting uh, what we see in cannabis. And then in 81, uh, Fairburn and Tip Pickens detected the presence of unidentified powerful synergists in cannabis extract causing 330% greater activity in mouse experiments than THC alone. Um, this is suggesting that THC doesn't work by itself. It works with its brothers and sisters, as it is in the plant. This is a problem I have with what we call recreational and medical cannabis. <laughs> What's the difference? Uh, even if a young person smokes a joint, they, they relax, they, they calm down, they, they might be more social. That's a therapeutic effect. Um, do we have recreational alcohol? And this is, this is to give you an idea of the crossover of particularly cannabidiol with other receptors. Um, this is why it has a, such a broad range of efficacy because it affects virtually every receptor system in our body, not, a, not only the CB1 receptor, other receptors such like the 5-HT receptor, GABA receptor, acetylcholine receptor are all affected by cannabidiol. And again, on to, uh, it, it modulates receptors. This is really important. CBD is a potent inhibitor of cytochrome P453A enzyme subfamily metabolism. Potent blocker. So if you put synthetic CBD into a, an animal system, it'll potently block a subfamily of enzymes, which is, metabolizes most pharmaceutical drugs, also metabolizes THC. If indeed you precondition the liver with uh, a natural product extract of CBD, 
and then smoke cannabis later in the day, you'll get a, a longer, less jagged like high and it'll, it'll be extended because you're not forming delta 11 THC which is four to 20 times stronger than THC and uh, you, do, you not, don't have a chance of overdosing so much. Yet if you're blocking a liver enzyme that metabolizes most pharmaceutical drugs potentially that can lead to an overdose because the concentration of these drugs go, they're not being metabolized, they go up in your blood and in your brain, potentially leading to an overdose. So synthetic THC can, or CBD can be dangerous. We don't see this effect in extract mixtures of high cannabidiol uh, containing extract because there are enzyme inducers as well as enzyme inhibitors in that mix. So things, things balance out, get adjusted, and you don't see potent blocking of liver enzyme uh, with extracted CBD. Uh, I just like that slide. Uh, herbal synergy active reduced. Yeah, today's technology, <laughs> I'm not taking this on myself, but we can, like I said earlier, identify and quantify every compound of the more than 1,200 that are in cannabis plant. Technically, we can, and theoretically, we can watch them all, quantify them all, and uh, try to make sense of them all. I wanted to show you a brief video, because it'll, if I can get... Uh, I'm going to get sound. We don't have sound. I've agreed to take part in a unique medical trial designed to find out. It's part of their ongoing research into the link between stronger cannabis and psychosis. The scientists are interested in the effects of the ratio between the two main components of cannabis, THC and cannabinoid. So on one day, I'm being injected with pure THC, something like ultra-high potency skunk. On the other day, I get a mixture of THC and cannabinoid, more like the natural makeup of the cannabis plant. When I get the injections, I don't know what I'm getting. It turns out that this one is a mixture of THC and cannabinoid. After 10 minutes, it hits me. With the THC and cannabinoid, no matter how hard I try to take the experiment seriously, it all seems hilarious. THC, it's a different story. It's horrible. It's like being at a funeral. Worse. It's sort of like, um, it's just so depressing. You'd want to, um, top yourself. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of morbid. After 15 minutes, I begin a series of psychological tests designed to measure whether I've become psychotic, and if so, how severely. I feel agitated. No. On the THC and cannabinoid mixture, I seem really flippant. On this drug, I just don't care. I'm experiencing profound insights. Bollocks. I'm worried the state of mind won't end. I don't want it to end. This experience is frightening. Strong. I feel agitated. Yeah, I 
do. I do. But with the pure THC, I'm suspicious. Introverted. I'll stop it there. She undergoes psychiatric tests. With the pure THC, she was 14 times the, the, the normal level of psychosis. And with the cannabinoid THC mixture, it was, it was less, but I, the point of that video is to show the difference between pure THC and, and an extract, and there's substantial difference. Uh, Dr. Hanush uh, took part in a, publishing a paper a year or so ago where they showed the difference between cannabidiol and extracted cannabidiol that they found that pure CBD made a bell curve-like effect, meaning you don't get any uh, effectiveness here. You get maximum effectiveness here, and at higher doses, you don't get any effect. This makes it difficult to use as a medicine because you have to hit the optimal right on with dosage or you don't see uh, uh, the right effect. And this was done with... Uh, injected into the abdominal cavity and orally, and they, I thought, just, they, they, less clinical use from that bell curve-like effect. That's a terrible slide. This uh, is about the entourage effects. CBD is not fully activated medicinally without THC, and, and THC is not effective without some CBD. Full plant extracts for plant or, or full plant-based medicines are the most effective. This is a bit of a summary of the entourage effect, the, the way we, we see it. Again, this is explaining the entourage effect, a bunch of many cannabinoids affecting different illnesses that uh, the very few are operating alone. You could also add terpenoids in there, as people do with these, these type of diagrams. I don't know where they get the time. Or the <laughs> but the, I call it the ingenuity of the hash smoker. I'll just move on a bit here. Now this is uh, how, I might get in the way here. Multi-receptor activity once again. Cannabinoids act as serotonin uptake inhibitors, similar to Prozac, enhance norepinephrine activity, similar to tricyclic antidepressants, increase dopamine activity, similar to monoamine oxidase inhibitors, augment GABA, like baclofen and benzodiazepines, provide antipsychotic benefits. Uh, what else do you need as a medicine? And you don't get side effects or toxicity from this type of medicine. You eat good, sleep good, and shit good. This is how the terpenoid eff affects, um, modulates cannab cannabinoid effect or works with them. Uh, brain function is enhanced by administering terpenoids and improves cerebral blood flow such as ginkgo lice and ginkgo biloba. Uh, cerebral blood flow increases after inhalation of cannabis and increases not related to plasma levels of THC, so something else is going on. Experiments have found that inhaling aerosolized THC causes more throat and airway and irritation than inhaling cannabis smoke. Um, I hope I'm making my point about natural cannabis. I never do a lecture without talking about this little girl here I've worked with for 10 years. Since she was 14, mum brought her to me because she knew that I was into standardized quality controlled cannabis medicine. And she was having 16 grand mal epileptic seizures per day. I was very, very lucky. This is the time my, my lab was in a dispensary in Vancouver that a hippie kid came in one day wanting to sell cannabis. And part of my job was to analyze the cannabis before the dispensary would buy it. And I ran it while the kid was sitting across my desk. 
the first peak to come out is cannabidiol, and from the literature I heard that CBD was more effective in treating epileptic seizures than THC. So this peak starts going up and up and up, and I, I get real excited because I know I've got something I can work with this girl with, and the kid starts to cry. <laughs> I didn't know why he cried that day, but I asked him about a year ago. I said, why did you cry when you were in my office? And he said, I was just having a bad day, and I was glad I could sell some pot to the club. I thought it was about how would you know that I was working with this girl, but um, nevertheless, we prepped this into an oral preparation and gave it to the mother of this girl, and her, her seizures went flat. Nothing. From daily seizures to nothing. Overnight. We took her to Children's Hospital, did CAT scans, EEGs, indeed a lessening of the pre-seizure activity and uh, so on. But anyway, after a month on this prep, she had a cluster of seizures when she had her period. That's gone on for seven, eight years. Mum, I named this strain Haley's Comet, and Mum locked on to this strain as being the answer for, for to her daughter's seizures. And we've actually found that by increasing the cannabidiol over the CBD ratio, She's even having less seizures now. So CBD seems to be very effective in epileptic seizures. You do need a little bit of THC, but we actually seesaw her seizures by giving her preps with high THC where she would seize more, high CBD she would seize less. And uh, she is a, a great crusader. I, I love this girl. I had the opportunity of escorting her to her high school graduation a couple of years ago, which is a real honor. She graduated from high school, wasn't expected to live past 15. She went through a special program, of course, because she's had brain damage, but nevertheless, she's a, she, she's a real artist, too. So. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the most common use of cannabis is for treating chronic pain. And this is... From the general public, I usually hear two questions. How do I access cannabis and how much do I take? Um, the way I see this meeting is going, I gather we're supposed to do a Q&A question and answer period tomorrow. Well, I'd like to answer people. I understand some people are here with illness and they want to get an idea of what sort of cannabis to use. I hopefully can provide you with some of that information tomorrow. Uh, but for chronic pain, seen many times, we often start people with cannabidiol and then increase the THC dosage to 100, 200 milligrams a day, either by suppository or oral. Uh, I'm not saying that smoking cannabis is not effective, but it's very difficult to quantify and to get workout dosage regimen using smoked cannabis. And I've always known about quality control and standardization of cannabis because I came into medical cannabis with my own research and develop company that was offering quality control and standardization services to the Canadian herbal Thank industry. God. Please speak to them. Well, they don't speak. Yeah, and uh, oh, that makes a difference, doesn't it? <laughs> um, I just switched the, the quality control parameters on to medical cannabis uh, when I began uh, working with that. It's the same principle. In Canada, we test for heavy metals, pesticides, pathogenic bacteria, and we standardize herbal products. It's the same for cannabis. Uh, I've offered this service to the dispensary in, in Vancouver for years now, and they only really care about one thing, how much THC is there. They don't give a, really care about heavy metals or, or pesticides because it's an overhead to them. But anyway, we offer that services. And any product that I'm involved in, it, it must be standardized and quality controlled. It's again standardization. You test for cannabinoids and terpenoid profiles. You could also test for flavonoids, polyphenols. We have that capability. And 
in Europe, suppositories, we're seeing really good effects, people using suppositories. In North America, people are, I don't know, they're a bit funny about putting stuff up their bum. It's not as socially acceptable as is here in Europe. But you get better effects with cancer than by oral administration. Um, a lot of this is an anecdotal, but we, we, we're building data all, all the time. And suppositories are effective route. And important, too, is that by suppository, you miss first pass through the liver, so you don't get as high. You don't experience a high from suppositories like you do from oral administration or even smoking. And I want to mention juicing um, because it's, mis it's, it's misunderstood. Um, this is a typical juicer here. The juice comes out this port and the pulp comes out the back. We've analyzed the juice versus the pulp. Now, <clears throat> firstly, all the cannabinoids end up in the pulp because they, they really don't like water. And so if you're going to utilize cannabis for cannabinoids, you want to eat the pulp. Not to say the juice is not valuable because it contains many minerals and vitamins and polyphenols, flavonoids, which are really good for you, anti-cancer and, and, and mood altering. Um, I just wanted to make that point about juicing, because um, uh, many people don't understand it. Uh, yeah, this is a quote from uh, Margaret Mead. It was given to me by a friend of mine from Slovenia. And uh, I want to make a point about Slovenian hemp. You've been growing it here for hundreds of years. You have a unique environment com compared to other countries in Europe. You have your own individual processing, curing methods, and making products from it. Canada is going legal next year right across the country with recreational cannabis. We'll be, if we go into a Canadian liquor store today, only 10% of the products come from Canada. The other, others come from around the world, Europe and South America and so on. Point is that Canada will be importing products from Europe, CBD products, THC products, and I don't see why Slovenian products cannot take a place in, in the Canadian marketplace and the U.S. because we're right next door. We ship a lot of products into the U.S. The world is changing around cannabis, and I... Most countries are waking up to its valuable usefulness and value, and it's uh, becoming legal. And uh, I understand that you've got a political environment here that tends not to be so easily pushed around, but people like Bojidar and other activists are banging on the door and rattling in the gates all the time to have cannabis legalized. My belief is that we must utilize in all capacity the full power of the plant. In my... In, in my greenhouse, uh, when I had it on a farm in Vancouver, uh, before we got busted. Um, this is back in the year 2000, but I had a, a six foot six Russian immigrant who was an amazing plant grower, um, growing the plants. And he used to say, we, we might be doing something illegal, but we're not doing anything wrong. And uh, I've always held that thought, even though I, I uh, our team broke up after we got busted. It was horribly traumatic, but I still hold that belief. And he also used to say, cannabis is like a buffalo. The native people used to use every part of the buffalo. You can use every part of the cannabis plant. It's extremely useful. Why do we have it illegal? It, it doesn't make sense at all. Anyway, I, I hope I've made some points about the difference between synthetics and uh, 
natural cannabis and told you about the entourage effect and uh, carry on folks. Thank you.